Hello again, Long Branch Baptist Church, and you know, let us continue to uh, persevere, not in our own strength, but in the power that uh, the Holy Spirit provides. And at this time, I'd like to pray for Sharmila, and you know, praise God that she's doing a lot better, uh, recovering from the infection. And also, let's keep uh, Caroline in prayer as well. She has flu-like symptoms. Uh, she has the flu, so let's uh, keep her in prayer. Please join me as we pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time, and uh, we lift up Sharmila to you. Praise God that she's doing uh, so much better, that you'll continue to watch over her and uh, give her grace, God. And thank you for Caroline as well, and that you will heal her of this flu, and thank you that it's not uh, COVID, that you'll continue to watch over her. And as we get into your word, we pray that you will speak to our hearts, uh, forgive us for our sins, and let it be your words, not mine. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'd like to talk about seek first the kingdom of God. You know, what does that mean to believers, to seek first the kingdom of God? And again, uh, as I said before, uh, once, uh, once in a while I'll be preaching on uh, different themes, different topics, uh, and today will be seek first the kingdom of God. And I'll be preaching from Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Matthew chapter 5, verse 7 to 20, Matthew chapter 5 to chapter 7, verse 29, is known as the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is speaking to his disciples, but there is also a crowd that is listening to him. And that's found in Matthew chapter 5, verse 1. And Matthew chapter 7 verse 28 and in Matthew chapter 4 verse 23 to 25 you see that Jesus was teaching he was healing he was casting out demons you know he became he was becoming famous people were gathering around him what's going on and in chapter 5 to chapter 7 verse 29 it says Jesus sat down and his disciples came to him you know Jesus doesn't care about crowds it wasn't about numbers that's not why Jesus came to this earth, to impress people, to get big numbers. But he came to do God's will. Not my will, but your will be done. He came to seek first the kingdom of God. And in John chapter 6, verse 60 to 71, we see that Jesus could care less about being popular and accepted in the world. You can imagine all these people were following Christ. They were fans, not followers. They're known as bandwagon fans. A bandwagon fan is someone who just jumps on the bandwagon when things look nice. So for example, I have uh, something to confess that I, you know, some of you might not really like this, but I'm a, I'm a bandwagon fan for the Raptors. So if the Raptors, you know, started to win championship after championship and made a dynasty like the Bulls or whatever, I have to be honest, I might jump on that bandwagon. I'm not a tr true Raptor fan, sorry, so, but we're, we're still Christians, so we, we love each other, right? But the truth is, once the Raptors start to lose, I'm probably the first one to jump off that bandwagon. And that's what's going on here. You have a lot of fans. They're not true followers of Jesus. They're bandwagon fans. And in John chapter 6, verse 60 to 71, they said, you know what, I'm out of here. This is too hard. You know, I, I don't want to be your disciple anymore. Maybe they were there just for the benefits, the healing, the casting out of demons, or what they could get from God. But they didn't understand the cost of discipleship. It was your life. It, make, it means that Jesus is your master, and, you're, and you seek first the will of your master. You don't just seek your will, or you don't just want something. You seek first your master's will. Some people couldn't handle that, and they left. Jesus was there to save lives, not to be popular. Sometimes when you preach the truth, you know, people will leave. So you can imagine Jesus teaching his disciples about the kingdom of God. Again, remembering the background, the crowds there as well. And what Jesus is teaching, it is impossible to keep in our own flesh. 
It says anger. You're angry at a person. That's like murder. How many times have we murdered people? Lust in your heart is the same thing as adultery. You must love your enemies. It's impossible in our own flesh to love those who hurt us. We can't do it. So yes, the Sermon on the Mount shows that it is impossible to keep the law and that we are truly sinful and we need a Savior. And that is Jesus Christ. No one can keep the law perfectly except for Christ. And because of that, we're all sinners deserving an e of an eternity of hell. And it was Christ who kept the law perfectly. But as well, as believers... For those who repent to put their trust in Christ, we have the Holy Spirit. And through the Spirit, we can obey God. Not perfectly. We will still sin. But again, that's not an excuse to just turn the, turn the grace of God into a license to sin. Oh, we all sin, so I'm just going to dive head into sin. So that's just want to make that clear. And it's not about trying harder in our own flesh. I'm just going to try harder not to get angry. Don't get angry. Don't get angry. Don't lust. Don't lust. Don't sin. Because we can't save ourselves. Salvation is by God's grace. It's a free gift. The gospel is not about just becoming a better person. The gospel is that we are all sinners. There is no one that is good. So when we repent, put our trust in Christ, then we continue to grow in holiness and sanctification. We are growing in obedience to the Word. It's the Holy Spirit working in our lives as we continue to pray without ceasing. We stay in the Word. We need our daily times with God whatever you want to call it quiet time, devotional time. You need those times, you need fellowship, share the gospel. So Jesus is teaching his disciples with the crowds listening on. He's teaching them. He's discipling them. Imagine what one of the biggest struggles of the disciples were. They must have faced was, what about money, Christ? We left everything to follow you. What are we going to do about money? Matthew chapter 19, verse 27, Peter said, We have left everything to follow you. Matthew was a tax collector. Some of them were fishermen. They left the security of these jobs to follow Christ. And in chapter 6, Jesus says, He talks about money, but He also talks about God's provision. And in chapter 6, verse 1 to 4, He says it's not about hoarding money, but it's about giving to the poor. So yes, you are my disciple. Yes, you left everything. But God will provide. But don't forget about the poor. And in chapter 6, verse 5 to 15, we have the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So you can imagine Jesus teaching his disciples on the Sermon on the Mount from chapter 5 to chapter 7. And it starts, the Lord's Prayer starts with what? Your, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. It starts with, seek first the kingdom of God. Let your, king, your kingdom come, your will be done. Seek first the kingdom of God. Then it goes on to say what? Give us this day our daily bread. It doesn't say, God, give us our daily bread and then your kingdom come. Then your will be done. It says, it starts with first, let your will be done. Your kingdom come. Give us our daily bread. Seek first the kingdom of God. God will provide for his disciples. God will give us what we need, not necessarily what we want. So basically, Lord's Prayer, as I seek the kingdom of God, my heavenly Father will provide. He comforts them again in chapter 6, verse 19 to 24. 29, 24. Sorry, chapter 6, verse 19 to 24. Do not lay up treasures on this, on this earth where moth and rust will destroy. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So they must have been worrying about money. And Jesus said, hey, don't build your treasures on this earth. Your treasures are in heaven. Be encouraged. 
And then he says in chapter 6, verse 24, you can't serve two masters. You can't serve both God and money. you got to make a choice. But as you serve God, as you seek His kingdom first, as you say, your kingdom come, your will be done, God will give us our daily bread. He will provide. That's what Jesus was saying. He's encouraging them to keep on following Him. And in today's passage, it makes it clear, do not be anxious. And in, in chapter 7, verse 7 to 11, again, talking to the disciples and the people listening, he says, if you need something, ask God, He will provide. Remembering that sometimes having more than we need, we can become arrogant and cocky. We can forget about God. The reason why God blesses us is so that we can bless others in need. Let us not forget that. In chapter 8, verse 18 to 22, he talks about the cost of discipleship. It's like, okay, if you want to be a disciple, this is the cost of discipleship. In chapter 19, verse 16 to 30, he talks to the rich man. And Jesus tells the rich person, sell everything and follow me. And it says the man went away sorrowful. The point is not, okay, sell everything, which God could call us to do. The point is he made money an idol. His security was not in God. His security was in his wealth and his ability to make wealth. In chapter 8, verse 23 to 27, he calms the storm, showing his disciples that he's in control even in the, even in the storms of life. In chapter 9, verse 35 to 38, Jesus continues to tell his disciples, your purpose is not in making money, but the harvest is plentiful and the workers are few. Seek first the kingdom of God. Chapter 10, verse 16 to 25, Jesus said, you'll face persecution and trials. But he says to them in chapter 10, verse 26 to 33, do not be ashamed of the gospel. Do not fear. And in chapter 11, verse 25 to 30, he says, I will give you rest for those who are weary. Come to me. All those who are trying to earn your salvation, my yoke is easy. And for the believers in Christ, we continue to find rest in him as we seek first the kingdom of God. In chapter 14, verse 20, chapter 14, verse 13 to 21, he feeds 5,000 with five loaves and two fish to show that God provides for his children. He was teaching them that. Seek first the kingdom of God. Chapter 22, verse 34 to 40, Jesus says the greatest commandment is what? To love God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. How do you love God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind? You seek first the kingdom of God. Chapter 24, verse 26, it says, No one knows the hour when Christ will return, but we must be ready. We must keep working in the field. We don't become lazy in our spiritual faith. We keep seeking the kingdom of God. Chapter 25, verse 31 to 46 says, Because we must be on guard. We must make sure we're in the faith because there is a day of judgment and there is hell. So again, you can have this, you have this picture of Jesus speaking to his disciples and he's encouraging them. Don't give up. Keep seeking the kingdom of God. God will provide. So in today's passage, chapter 6, verse 25 to 34, it's clear. Do not worry about your life. God is speaking to us today in the word. And he says, if we're going to be his true disciples, we might lose everything. But we have eternal life in Christ. This will separate the true and the false disciples. A disciple follows their teacher. A disciple follows their master. Jesus said, pick up your cross and follow me. I remember, you know, I shared the story of the youth pastor that slapped me in my face 20 years ago. And I remember she used to go around after this and she used to tell people, Alex, yeah, he's my disciple after God got a hold of me. Yeah, yeah, that's my disciple. And I remember people telling me she's going around telling people that I'm her disciple. I was thinking, I'm not, I'm not her disciple. I'm not following her. If anything, I learned what not to do. A disciple follows their teacher. The question is, who are we following after? Verse 25, Matthew chapter 6, verse 25, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes? 
So the believer in Christ, Jesus is saying, our lives are more than food. It's, it's more. Our, we have more to think about than just our food and our clothes. We still have to work, don't get me wrong. That's found in 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6. They were having some issues in the church in Thessalonica because they're saying Christ is returning. We're not going to work. Let's just... No, he said you've got to continue to work for the glory of God. But our trust and faith is in God to provide, not ourselves. Because if it was in ourselves, we would become prideful. The reality is God has given us grace to work and and he has provided. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 17 to 18 says, Be careful because your heart might become prideful and you might say, I made this wealth. But God, it says in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18, it was God who has given you that ability to do that. And life is not just about paying bills. The greatest commandment is not pay your bills. The greatest commandment is love God with all of your heart, all of your soul, and all of your mind. In other words, seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first the will of God is what Jesus was teaching his disciples. And the disciples were meant to teach other disciples. Disciples make disciples. And it, it continues on. That's the vision of the church. And it's one thing to know it in our heads. Yeah, yeah, okay, Pastor Alex, I know this, I know this. Seek first the kingdom of God. It's one thing to know it in our heads, but it's another thing to apply it in the power of the Holy Spirit. Matthew chapter 15, verse 8 to 9 says, This people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me and they worship in vain. Some people, it's just, it's just yeah, yeah, seek first the kingdom of God. Yeah, I agree with it, but their actions show otherwise. Their worship is in vain. Their hearts are away from God, are far from God. Remembering again, remembering again that it's so easy to be consumed with this fear. That's why Jesus had to remind them. What am I going to eat? What am I going to wear? In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 19, it says, you have, you, Whatever has mastered you, you have become that slave to whatever has mastered you. Whatever overcomes you, you have become enslaved to it. And we always think of, yeah, it's, it's talking about lust and pornography and sexual sins and money. But it also can be applied to fear. You're so consumed with worry and anxiety. If that's mastered you, that's an idol. To worry is sin. To worry, you're saying, I don't need God. I'm just going to think, I'm going to figure this out on my own. That's sin. What's the answer to that? You repent and you pray. And when you pray... You're saying, God, I can't fix this on my own. I need you. That is why Jesus says in verse 25, do not worry. Your life is more than these. And that's why we need accountability as, as believers. That's why we need to gather as believers, God willing. Because we got to keep each other accountable. It's not just a social group, but we need each other to help each other in our struggles. It's like, oh, I don't need you. I, you know, I could buy this. I could buy that. I, I don't need anybody. I don't need the body of Christ. I'm good. No, because we all have different sins. We need that accountability. That's why I want to encourage you for the men. Come to the men's fellowship on this Saturday. Uh, sorry, that was uh, yesterday. But c- encourage you to keep coming out to the men's fellowship. And that's... Uh, If you have questions on that, that's every other month. Just talk to myself, Pastor Rob, 10 to 11. Find that accountability. There's Bible studies going on throughout the church. Come to the Tuesday. Come to the Thursday prayer meeting. And understanding this, what is our priorities? What does it look like? Is it like life, family, work, and then Jesus? Or is it like friends, school, work, and Jesus? Hey, hey, hey. I got Jesus in there. That's fine, right? As long as I got Jesus in there, it's all good. No, it should be Jesus first. You know, I have a buddy of mine who's doing the whole um, online dating thing, right? And I'm trying to help him to find a, a, a good profile. And there's three different profiles that I found. The first profile is, I love God with all my heart, my soul, and my mind. The other is, I love my cat. I love to work and I love to walk. Oh yeah, by the way, I love Jesus. The other profile is like, there's no mention of Jesus. So I was encouraging him, go for the profile that says, I love God with all of my heart, my soul, and my mind. Not, I love my cat, and then, yeah, 
I love Big Macs and I love Jesus. That no. And as Christians, sometimes that's we can do the same thing. Yeah, I love I love lie, I love this, but I also love Jesus. No. We seek first the kingdom of God. He's our priority. Revelation chapter 3, verse 16, Jesus said, You're neither hot nor cold. I will spit you out because you're lukewarm. That's a serious thing. That's not a pretty analogy. That's not a pretty picture of spitting something out. That's for believers, quote unquote believers, that find out they're not believers in the end. That is why we need to nourish our faith together as a family together as a church, together with your own family, as a couple. You know, Jess and I right now, we're reading a book together, Knowing God by J.I. Packer. It's encouraging. Do read a study Bible together. And the point of reading is not to argue about theology, right? My theology is better than yours. Oh, your theology is terrible. We need to agree on the primary issues. Don't get me wrong, right? The virgin birth, the trinity, being saved by grace, those are the primary issues. But secondary, there are certain things that we can agree to disagree you know, Revelation is said to be the most preached book in the early church. Can you imagine? They're going through persecution. It gives them so much hope. But in our day, it's one of the least preached book because everybody's arguing, your view of Revelation is wrong. My view of Revelation is right. No! You know, Satan's laughing at that because the point of Revelation was to unite us, to give us hope. The point is Christ is coming back. We're not God. We don't know every single detail. But Satan's laughing because instead of unity, it's causing division. There's a proper way to rebuke. You, you do it with love, not harshly. I remember watching this video of a woman sharing the gospel. Everything she's saying was right, but then a person asked her to calm down and she started cursing her out with swear words. Beep, beep, beep. So what you're saying was, 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 was it was right in regards to the gospel, but then your attitude was wrong. You're cursing that person out. We could say the right thing, but if a heart is not right, then it could just be pride. You know, Satan knows the Bible too. Satan was there in Job. He was there in the Gospels. He even quoted the scripture to Jesus. It's one thing to know it. It's one thing to apply it. So again, what are our priorities? Our priorities will show what is most important to us. If we say God is most important, yeah, I want to seek his kingdom, but our actions are different. What's going on? And this is not a guilt trip. The Bible doesn't give us a guilt trip, but the Bible convicts us because that guilt is meant to lead us to change. If you're interested in cars, you study it. You, you study what you're passionate about, right? Ah, money, how to make money. Well, you're going to study how to make money. Maybe COVID, I want to keep up to date with COVID. You're going to read articles on COVID. If there's no passion for the Word of God, it's probably a good time to examine our hearts. So how do we get this passion for the Word of God? Well, first, we need to repent, confess that we are sinners, that we deserve an eternity of hell. But when we put our trust and faith in Jesus Christ, that He died for us, taking the penalty for our sins, that He rose from the grave, that He's sitting at the right hand of the Father. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. We will spend an eternity in heaven. Remembering that justification is a one-time thing. We are saved once and for all. But as believers, we need to repent daily because we sin daily because we're not perfect. But again, that's not an abuse. That's not an excuse to abuse the grace of God because Christ didn't just break the penalty, penalty of our sin. He broke the power of sin in our lives. And, and then we become a child of God. Then we have the Holy Spirit. And naturally, arising from within, we have a passion for God. If you haven't truly repented, I want to encourage you to do that. John chapter 6, verse 68, Peter said, Where would I go, Jesus? You have the words of eternal life. Where else would we turn? Verse 26 to 30. He's talking about the birds. Look, are you not more important than the birds? You know, in my house, outside my home, on the driveway where we park our cars, all the, all the different cars, there's kind of like an indent in the, in the cement. And when it rains, it just fills up like a little pond. And the birds come. And, and I'm not even kidding. When it starts to dry up, I'm not even kidding. The next day it rains. It's like God fills it up. It, that's what it says in verse 26. Look at the birds. They don't sow. They don't reap. But your heavenly Father feeds them. You know, I'm thinking maybe on the side I'll become a weatherman because I could tell you when it's going to rain. Usually when that puddle dries up, the next day or two it rains. Chapter 6, verse 28 to 30. He says, you of little faith. You remember Peter walking on the waves. And then he saw the waves coming and he started to doubt. And Jesus said, you have little faith. 
verse 31 to 32. It says, it says in verse 32, the pagans run after these things. In this context, it's talking about the unbelievers. This is what the unbelievers do. Why are you acting like an unbeliever? You say you believe in God with your mouth, but in your actions you live like you don't really believe. It's backwards. You pay your bills and then you seek God. But it should be the other way around. This is what makes us different than the world. We seek God's will. We go against the grain. We walk the narrow path. So if we act like the world, behave like the world, watch, what's, watch what the world watches, listens to what the world listens to. Our language is the same. We do business like the world does business. We worry like the world worries. We hate like the world hates. Then are we true followers of Jesus? We can't manufacture this love and passion. It has to be an inner transformation as we repent and put our trust in Him. Amen. Verse 33. Seek first the kingdom, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. What is God's will? Jesus said, Not my will, but your will be done. We seek the will of God, the great commission to love God with all our hearts, our soul, and our mind, to build up the church, to be the lighthouse on the lake shore. It's God who is the light, but we are his salt and light. We seek first his righteousness, his holiness. We live to obey God. Verse 34. We trust God, right? One side is, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. You know, one side is just consumed with worry. The other side is prideful, saying, I don't need to worry about tomorrow. James chapter 4, verse 13 and 16, and they're boasting. I'm going to do this and do that. I'm going to make money here and there. But it says we are but a mist. And there's always a temptation for pastors And what God says to pastors is, do not worry about numbers. Seek first the kingdom of God. Be faithful to your task. That's why some pastors, especially in the States, have watered down the gospel to get a bigger crowd. And as long as people are in the church, who cares? You know, some churches, it's all about the fog machines and laser lights. Can you imagine that? There's nothing wrong with that in itself. But if you throw out the gospel and say, we don't need that anymore. We want to attract people with, with a fog machine and laser, laser lights. There's something wrong with that. Can you imagine if we had that here? That'd be nice, right? So I would enter. You would have a fog machine. And, and then I would enter through the mist. Wow, what an entrance. And then laser lights. Again, there's nothing wrong with that in itself, but if you throw out the gospel, I don't need the gospel. Let's attract people with this. Yes, there's something wrong with that. That's not our mission, to get more numbers in a crowd. Remember with Jesus, he didn't care about how many numbers he had. He was there to preach the truth. It's not growth for the sake of growth. That's not why the church exists. Don't chase numbers, but we make disciples. There's a big difference. And remembering the Spanish flu 100 years ago, you might have thought the church was going to die. They didn't have Zoom back then. They didn't have cell phones. They just At times they couldn't meet, but God used that to strengthen the church. The church didn't die. Maybe some churches have died, but God overall used that to strengthen the church because it forced us to get on our knees. It forced us to be united together. You know, I remember listening to the fellowship conference where, where the pastors met and they gave their stories. I remember missionaries. This was this past week in the Fellowship National Conference. And the missionaries, they were saying they were worried because of COVID. But then they, sh- they started sharing stories that God was working even in the midst of COVID. I was getting goosebumps. I'm getting goosebumps right now. I'm not sure if you can see it. But missionaries, God was working in the midst of COVID. That, isn't that amazing? He's still working. God is still saving souls. Amen. Because nothing can stop the will of God. That's why we pray, not our will, but God's will be done. And the truth is this. Some, close, some churches may close, yeah, but you cannot destroy God's church. And the pastors are called to be faithful. After COVID, there's going to be a temptation just to fill seats, right? And God is saying to that pastor, seek first the kingdom of God. Do not be anxious. Anybody could get a crowd. Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, gangsters have crowds. If that's all we wanted, I'm pretty sure I could get a crowd. If that's all, if we just threw out the gospel and all we wanted was people in the church and crowd, I'm pretty sure I could do that. I'm pretty sure 
that I could be a stand-up comedian. Not, not in a secular sense because of the language, but there's, things, there's such things as Christian stand-up comedians. I'm pretty sure I could do it. I'm pretty sure I can stand up for 10, 20 minutes and just tell jokes. So can you imagine? No more sermon. We just throw out the gospel and I just tell jokes for 10 minutes. And then after that, we have an interpretive dance. So no more sermon. My sermon is now an interpretive dance. Why? To entertain you. That's going to draw people, right? So we look something like this. The butterfly emerges from the cocoon. In the same way the Christian enters. Do you want to watch that for 10 minutes? But maybe there, there might be some people, it would attract them to the church. And then at the end, you know what I could do for you? I could break dance. So I'm 37 years old, but I can still do some of the moves. That could get a crowd. People go, wow, have you heard of Long Branch, that church where that guy, you know, he, he does, you know, a stand-up comedian act for 10 minutes and then an interpretive dance, and then he break dances, and I do a freeze, boom, see you next week. That could probably get a crowd, I'm pretty sure. But that's not what God has called us to do. There's nothing wrong with those things in itself, but if you throw out the gospel and you just try to attract people, that's dangerous because you're going to lose souls. Why do people come to church? To be entertained? They come to hear the gospel to get saved. And the believer comes to get fed. You know, Charles Spurgeon said it best. He said this in, 18, in the 1800s. And I'm just summarizing. He basically said this. One day, instead of the shepherds feeding the flock with the word of God, there will be clowns in the church that will be entertaining the goats. What a heavy, heavy quote. One, he said this in the 1800s, one day the church, the shepherds will no longer be feeding them with the word of God, but there will be clowns entertaining the unbelievers. We just want unbelievers. Who cares if they never get saved as long as we have them in the church? If your heart is not motivated by the kingdom of God, then you're not going to want to hear about the kingdom of God. If you, wanna, if you hear a talk on how to get rich fast and it's guaranteed, you'll give your attention to that for two hours, right? It shows where our heart is. If we can watch a one and if we can watch a one and an hour, one hour and a half movie, but we can't stand the word of God, that might show where our hearts really are. Our hearts will be where our treasure is. John chapter 21, verse 15 and 19, Jesus said to Peter, Feed my sheep. He said it a second time, feed my lambs. And then he said, Tend to my sheep. Continue to feed them. The calling that the disciples had and Peter had was to feed the sheep, to take care of the sheep with the word of God. Imagine if there was no more sermon. Let's just say every church just said no more, no more gospel. Think about all the generations of people that would be lost in the future. We have a heavy responsibility. Imagine if the early church, if they stopped preaching the gospel and we said we want to be a social group then that gospel would never reach us. We would be hopeless if they didn't continue to preach the gospel. That's why Acts chapter 6, verse 4, they said we will devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. And that's where deacons came to, so that they can continue to preach. There's a temptation to take the offense out of the gospel, not realizing that the very offense is what we need to hear in order to be saved. I heard this illustration of a surgeon. They have to use a knife Right? To, to cut the, the patient. Imagine a person has heart, heart disease. They're going to use a knife. But what if that surgeon goes, this knife is too sharp. I don't want to, you know, it's going to hurt them. And there's going to be blood. There's going to be a scar. I don't want to be mean and harsh. You have to cut him to save him. Not realizing that the offense of the gospel is what leads us to repentance, reminding us that we are under the wrath of God. A lot of churches in North America, it's a mixture of the prosperity gospel, liberal theology, and the seeker-sensitive church. They've taken aspects. Prosperity gospel is all about blessings. Liberal church, there's no such thing as sin. The seeker-sensitive church, let's just, sh let's just get them in the church. I remember talking to this one pastor. He said, basically, I could care less about church discipline. I could care less about if they're even saved. I could care less even if our leaders are liberal in theology. As long as people are in the church, I don't care. That's false advertising. Because the person who puts up their hand 10 years later, and then they read the fine print, and it says, oh, I have to surrender my life to Christ? I didn't sign up for this. It's a bait and switch. How did we get saved in the first place? I think about myself hearing about hell. It scared me. 
I remember there was a, even a time in my life where I started to share without hell. I took the offense out. The very thing that led me to the cross to truly understand the good news, I took it out. I just wanted hands risen. As pastors, we are called to be faithful, to hear well done, good and faithful servant. Not well done, your church had a lot of people. Why? Because we're accountable to God. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. Leaders are keeping watch over your souls who must give an account to God. James chapter 3, verse 1. Those who teach will be judged with greater strictness. As Superman said, with great power comes great responsibility. No, Superman didn't say that, but you get what I'm saying. In summary and in closing, this is not just moralism. Be a better person. We are saved by grace, not by works. We are all sinners deserving of hell. That is why we are humbled. We are separated from our sin. Because of our sin, we are reconciled through the shed blood. We are thankful that God sent His Son who lived the life that we could not live, who obeyed perfectly, fulfilling the requirements of the law. And because of that, it's Christ's righteousness, not ours. And we have hope because there is forgiveness, love, mercy at the cross. And that is why we can live every day in the midst of our trials because the Holy Spirit is with us. And we have hope because Satan is defeated. We have the victory in Christ. He will spend an eternity in the lake of fire, Scripture tells us. I remember I, I shared this story before, but my buddies all got sent to the hospital. Back in the day, 20 years ago, I was the only one who got away. And I was in the streets by myself at 12. Just, you know, the people we confronted, they were still looking for us. Imagine if I got caught and eventually my big brothers came back and found me. That gave me hope in the same way as believers Christ is coming back for us. We're not alone. We have God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Even in our darkest times, when we are lonely, we feel betrayed, we feel hurt, God is with His children. So how do we seek the kingdom of God first? Just keep reading the Word. Don't give up. Set that quiet time, whatever you want to call it, every day. Pray without ceasing. Have fellowship. Examine your hearts and continue to share the gospel. Let us pray. Thank you for this Word in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless.